I have made several attempts at making this video now, and each time I have kind of talked myself into confusion and uh, and started over. I'm going to take one more try at it because I, I really think I I don't have a deep enough understanding to do a very good job of explaining it. Uh, Richard Feynman famously said something like, "If you if you can't explain something to a freshman, you don't understand it." And I don't, um, but I do feel like I understand it a tiny bit. And in a continuing, uh, my continuing philosophy of if I understand it 5% more than you, I'll try and talk to you about it until we both understand it maybe 3% more than we did. <laughs> so let's give it a go. Uh, I've got an Excel spreadsheet here where I'm going to try and represent what the P and the D term do and, and hopefully make it a little easier for people to understand. And first of all, I've got the source code here uh, for this is the PID controller one. Um, hang on a second. I'm going to sneeze. And I'm back. Um, I've got the source code here for PID controller one. And I want to show you, uh, if you're not a coder, this is probably all Greek to you. But right here, where we calculate the D term, we calculate the delta, which is the difference in error between the last sample. That's, the, in other words, the previous loop and this loop. And then we take a three sample moving average, uh, which is a very simple form of low pass filter. And then here is Boris's wonderful addition. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, where is it? Where's the, where's the filter? Oh yeah, no, that's it. Here's Boris's wonderful addition where we do the actual low pass filtering. But, but basically what I want to show you is that the D term is a three pass moving average of the error over, over time. So let's, let's, find a simpler way of putting that. D in PID stands for derivative, which if you know calculus, the derivative is the change in the function over time. And a very, very simple way to take the change in a function over time is to, let's say that, is to subtract to the, the value now from the previous value. So let's say that at a given point in time, our P value is zero. And what that means is that our error is zero. In other words, whatever angular rate we are commanding, uh, it is being achieved. So if the stick is centered, that would correspond to an angular rate of zero. And that would mean the copter is achieving an angular rate of zero. It is hovering perfectly. Uh, now, I said it's hovering perfectly, but that's not true because it could be flipped upside down on its head. As long as it is not rotating, the angular rate is zero and the p term is zero. Uh, so, so there you go. Um, and let's say that we push the stick forward and now the copter's angular rate is zero, but it is being commanded to pitch forward at some angular rate, 20 degrees per second, 30 degrees, whatever it is. Well, so now we have some error and the p term is going to rise. So let's say the p term rises to a value of 50. The D term can be calculated. Now I showed you that in reality the D term is calculated as a three term or three sample moving average. We're just going to do a one sample average, or not even an average. We're just going to subtract. So we're going to say that the D term is equal to the P term uh, in this sample minus the P term in the previous sample. Uh, in reality, the, the D term is not based directly on the P term. The P term is proportional to the error. So let's say the error is 50 and the P gain is uh, 2. Well, that would mean that the P term would actually be 50 times 2 equals 100. And the D term would be calculated based on the error. So in order to keep this example simple, um, let's just assume that our P gain is 1. And, and therefore, our P term is going to be equal to our error. And we can just ignore error and only think about the P term. All right, so what does the D term do when the P term rises to 50? The D term goes to 50. Okay, so let's say that the copter now achieves its desired angular rate. Okay, and since the copter has achieved its desired angular rate, so let's say we push the stick forward, we command it so many degrees per second of change. Now the P term pushed, the P term went positive, that corresponded to an output of the motors. And in fact, we should add the sum in here. This is the PID sum, which would be the output of the motors. 
okay? So the PID sum went up, the motors made some change, and uh, now the copter is moving at the targeted angular rate. So now the copter is pitching forward and is continuing to pitch forward, right? The P term now goes back to zero because the desired angular rate has been achieved. No change needs to occur, okay? And it will continue to be zero until the stick moves again. So let's say it continues to be zero for some amount of time. In fact, let's just copy this value forward. And we'll also copy this value forward. Let's say it continues to be zero for some amount of time. And then the stick returns to center. And so now let's say the exact opposite happens. Take a minute and look at what happens, and pause the video if you need to, but take a minute and look at what happens to the PID sum and the D term when these changes occur. And what I want to call out to you first is that in the time slice where the P term moves, the D term also moves. And in the time slice where the P term uh, stays the same, the D term doesn't move at all. Okay, so we can see the effect of the D term on the sum. And we can see that, for example, in time slice one, the D term has, the, has an accelerating effect, you could say. The P term goes up by 50, but the sum goes up by 100. Okay, and here, when the D term dropped to zero, or the P term dropped to zero, the D term had an effect as well. And you can see that the sum went to negative 50. And here, where it stayed the same, the D term didn't do anything. And also, let's say, uh, let me give you another example here. Let's say that in, instead of returning to zero, we failed to achieve the angular rate in one loop time. And so the P term stayed at 50 for some amount of time. Notice that when the P term spikes, the D term accelerates its movement by adding to the PID sum. But then as the P term stays the same, the D term returns to zero and stops contributing to the PID sum. So let me, I'm going to just tweak this example just a little. I'm going to increase by 50 for three cycles, then I'm going to stay at the same for three cycles or four cycles, and then I'm going to drop back down again by 50. And here we can see the P term is rising and the D term is adding, adding in. At the moment that the P term stops rising, the D term returns to zero and drops back down again. So we get this spike in the PID. So the PID sum is increased linearly relative to the P term by the D term. We get this peak, and then as the P term stops increasing, the, PI, the, the D term goes to zero and stops contributing. So, uh, and then as we get to the other side, 50, 100, 50, 0, 50, 100, 50. Yeah, that's right. That's all right. As we get to the other side, the P term drops off linearly. The D term, as the P term begins to drop, the D term also uh, subtracts from the PID sum, and we see the same thing in reverse. So, so what can we take from this? Um, the idea, the common idea that the D term is damping is just not correct. It is true that in if you have p term oscillations, adding d can reduce them. And that so functionally speaking, the d term can damp the p term, uh, the effect of the p term on the PID sum, or more fundamentally, the the, the effect of the p term on flight characteristics. But what uh, what d is actually doing is uh, when p moves, d amplifies the effect of the P term on the PID sum. And I think amplify is a good word for it. When P is changing, whether, whether P is increasing or decreasing, and regardless of the absolute value of P, in other words, we could do the same example with 
500, 550, 600. It would look exactly the same, just shift it up to a, a higher value. The D term would look the same, though. So when P moves, the D term amplifies the effect of that movement on the PID sum. And when P is stationary, the D term is doing nothing regardless of the value of P. So the reason we think of the, the D term as damping is that here when we see P falling to zero, the D term helps it get there faster. The PID sum gets to zero faster than it would have if we were only using the P term. And here when we see the P term climbing, trying to hit this, this target angular rate, whatever it may be, we can see that the D term helps it get there faster. So that's another way you might think of it. Wherever the P term is going, the D term helps the copter get there faster. But it's not correct to think of that as damping. It's, it's, you think of it as damping because you tend to think of it as when the P term is falling, the D term helps it get to zero faster. But in fact, uh, it also helps it when it's rising. Um, and, and so that's why uh, excess D can actually cause oscillations. If you have the right amount of D, the D term will help the P term get the PID sum where it needs to go quicker, and you'll get better response, you know. But if you have too much D, it will actually cause the exact same kind of overshoot you're trying to get rid of. All right. Uh, I hope that was more helpful than it was confusing, and I also hope I didn't make any huge technical mistakes. And also, if you, uh, I'll try and see if I can link a copy of this spreadsheet to the post in case anybody else wants to play with it. Alrighty.